Tonight on It's a Miracle. A young woman becomes the unwitting victim of a carjacking. What are you doing? Get out of the car. Get out of the car. And I began to fight with the guy. And then I grabbed the steering wheel and was blowing the horn at the same time, hoping to draw attention or to get him to stop. But nothing could stop him. Nothing but a miracle. Plus, during the cesarean delivery of premature twins, the mother's heart suddenly flatlines, and all efforts to revive her appear to fail. You know, I remember thinking at that point that I want my wife back, but I'm never going to take another day for granted. I'm never going to take another I love you or a hug for granted. And I want my wife back in any condition. And a man wakes from a terrifying dream, only to find himself hours later reliving it moment by moment. The dream led me through that fire. Every bit of that dream was true at the actual fire. And I actually went to where he was, as if I knew where he was. These stories and more tonight on It's a Miracle. And now your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show is filled with suspense, mystery, and a surprise or two. And our first story contains all of the above. It places a young mother and her infant child in a dangerous, life-threatening situation, a situation that might have been impossible to escape if it weren't for a miracle. On a Monday in April of 1999, Esther Green and her infant daughter, Victoria, were visiting at the home of her best friend, Musana Hoskins. I had called Musana and we hadn't saw each other in about a week. And I said I was gonna bring the baby over and we were gonna just sit, you know, and talk. I had a few errands to run, so I asked her if she wanted to come with me. She said, yeah, we'll come with you. Yeah. Esther's decision wasn't without some misgivings. That morning, she'd experienced a peculiar feeling that had nearly forced her to abandon her plans. Something just whispered saying, stay home. And I paused for a moment and I said, well, it's just right up the street. Ignoring her strange premonition, Esther proceeded to drive Musana on her errands. A few minutes later, they were exiting a parking lot when they had a close call. This black truck cut us off and then slowly drove by us. And I stopped and I looked at them and I was like, that's strange. Once again, Esther shrugged off an unsettling feeling and the two women continued on to their next destination. She got out and she went inside the store and Victoria and I, we sat at the curb waiting. My daughter was in the back seat drinking her juice. All of a sudden she dropped her cup and started to cry for it. And it was in the furthest possible space to reach. I turned around and glanced at Esther and I noticed she had gotten in the back seat of the car. And I turned back around and finished what I was doing. There you go. Is that better? It's fine. And that's when I heard the driver's side door opening. I'm going to stay back here with her. And when I looked up, What are you doing? I saw this young white male sitting there, and our eyes met. And my heart just dropped into my lap. Musana had no idea what was happening. When the car took off, I knew something was strange. I knew something was not right. She immediately went back into the print shop for help. 
But inside the Mercedes, the nightmare was just beginning. I grabbed the steering wheel and pulled it and was blowing the horn at the same time, hoping to draw attention or to get him to stop. But she only managed to make him angry. Lady, if you don't sit back, I'm gonna shoot you. The threat of violence stopped Esther in her tracks. I stopped fighting and I sat back and he took off out of the, out of the parking lot. What do you want? I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? Pull up. Shut up! I just had my head down because I was like, how did I get my daughter into this? And looking down at the floor was my diaper bag and in the side pocket was my cell phone. Praying that he wouldn't see her, Esther slipped the phone out of the bag and dialed 911. At the communication center in Fayetteville, a young 911 operator named Holly Eason had just come on duty. Fayette County 911. When I first answered the call, the only thing that I could hear was screaming. So the first thing that I thought it was was going to be a husband and wife or domestic situation going on inside of the car. Ma'am, where are you at? She was on a cell phone, so we didn't have a location of where she was at. She won't talk to me. All I can hear is her screaming. She will not talk to me. When you hear the call going on with her yelling and screaming, saying she had a baby in the car, you're just thinking, okay, I've got to get this down, and I've got to get these officers on the way to help her. Please, ma'am, where are you at? Unable to talk to the caller or determine her whereabouts, Holly was helpless until a second call came in. We're done 911. Where is your emergency? Hi, uh, my girlfriend has a Mercedes. I believe it's a 99 or a 2000. She just, uh, I believe she was just abducted and the car was stolen with her in it and the newborn baby in the back seat. That's when we started putting the pieces together and we realized that this was going to be linked together. She couldn't talk to me. It was a carjacking. Once I realized it was a carjacking, I knew there was a possibility that I might not ever see her again. I was just a nervous wreck and just praying and just falling out on the floor, just not knowing what was going to happen to her. The terrifying conclusion when it's a miracle continues. When we return. You can have the car. You can have the car. I thought you can have the car. <laughs> they were not just taking the car. So I figured that they did want us there for some purpose, some sick purpose. We didn't know if they had weapons on them or anything like that. So her safety and her child's safety were still in the balance. Shortly after being abducted from a parking lot, Esther Green discovered her cell phone on the floor of the back seat and used it to call 911. The emergency operator, Holly Eason, quickly began piecing information together and relaying it over the police radio. Please, I have a baby in the car. I have a baby. What are you going to do? There's a child in the car. Stop this car. This Mercedes means nothing to me. Inside the vehicle, Esther could barely control her terror. But she knew that if there was someone on the other end of the line, she had to act quickly. Esther began shouting out familiar landmarks in an effort to help police pinpoint her location. And then she said Tinseltown Movie Theater. If she was passing Bells and Bows and then Tinseltown, we knew she was going north on 314. So we had officers start in that direction. Back at the print shop, Musana waited desperately for any news from the police. It was one of the worst feelings I think I've ever experienced in my life. 
I felt completely helpless and um, I couldn't quite figure how everything was going to work out okay. I just had to hope and pray that it did. Oh my God, please help me! Somebody help me! Please let this party get out of the car. I don't care. It's going to be Highway 85 coming up. Please. 85 is coming up. Please. What about Fulton? Has anybody notified Fulton? Get out the car. Come on, please. Oh, where are you going to take us? Where are we going to go? Miraculously, the carjacker never figured out Esther's ploy. But a few long minutes later, there were still no police cars in sight. When the suspect entered a parking lot and slowed down, Esther thought that her ordeal might be over. But unfortunately, her situation was about to become twice as perilous. Holly realized that the stakes had changed. There were now two suspects in the vehicle. There's two occupants. So what do y'all want? There's going to be more than one subject. Holly knew that with two criminals present, Esther was in even greater danger. We didn't know if they had weapons on them or anything like that. So her safety and her child's safety were still, you know, in the balance. Why won't you take the car? Why won't you take the car? Please just take the car. Please. You have to put all of your emotions and feelings aside and deal with what's going on because you're in charge of getting the officers out there to find her and get this vehicle stopped. Okay, why are we getting back on Highway 85? Highway 138 and Highway 85. Moments later, Esther spotted an approaching police vehicle. Oh my God, there's a police behind us. Oh my God. I heard her say there's the police. So we told the officers we knew that they were behind the vehicle. The cell phone was still on and I was still on the line with her. Why are they asking you to stop? And that's when they pulled her over. We still didn't know what could happen at that point until they were in handcuffs and being taken away. Esther jumped from the car with her baby and ran to the officers. I heard the canine dog barking and I heard one of the officers yell at him to put their hands up and get on the ground. They came and opened up the two doors asking them to come out and then I jumped out afterwards and just started screaming. As soon as we got in the car, all that bottled up energy was released. And I held on to my little girl so tight, and I kept on leaning over to her, telling her that the angels are with us, we're okay, the angels are with us. And I just thanked God for just letting us be standing on solid ground and away from that horrible, horrible situation. When it was over, there was just a sigh of relief going on inside of our radio room. And after we hung up the phone, we just, wow, you know, that was just amazing. I began to thank the police for finding us, and they were thanking me. And I said, how come you're thanking me? I'm the one who got carjacked. You rescued me. And they said, no, if you hadn't done what you did, we would never have been able to find you and your baby. I believe in miracles, uh, and looking back on this, I know that this one was. Oh my God, please help me! It's a miracle that they were able to pick up on what was going on with her call. It's a miracle that these guys didn't harm her, that they didn't hurt the baby. And I truly believe that God was just looking down on them. They were not letting me out, so I figured that they did want us there for some sick purpose. 
just looked over at my daughter. Here she was, 10 months old. She had just taken her first steps the night before, and how bad of a mother was I to allow this to happen to her? And I just knew right then that I had to do something to get out of the situation. We're headed down 314. 314. Why are we headed down this way to the airport? She basically saved herself by forming everything that she was saying in a question. She would say, why are you passing Tinseltown? Why are you going north on 314? She was doing that so she would not give herself away that she had actually dialed 911. This was a miracle because she's still here and her child's still here and all the officers are still here with their families because it, it could have turned tragic. I know that this situation was guided by the angels because Miracles happened every step of the way. Can I get your telecom? Yeah. Hello. You want to speak to Victoria? Hold on. Here, it's for you. I just knew that I had to survive this for her sake. Hello, Daddy. So that she'd have a wonderful life in spite of anything that happened that day. It's been over a year since Esther Green's ordeal, and we wanted to update you on her story. So she joins us now from her home in Jericho, New York. Hello there. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Esther, I'm sure everybody wants to find out what happened to those two men who abducted you. Has there been any resolution to the case? The carjackers this past March were convicted of carjacking and kidnapping. They are now serving a 22-year sentence. Well, I hope that that helps put your mind at ease. But how's Victoria coping with that terrifying incident? Um, it affected my daughter uh, for some weeks after the carjacking. She was waking up with nightmares and just wanting me to comfort her. My husband, she would shoo him away, and she would just cling on to me. So, And she was also afraid of strange men that we would come in contact with while we were out. How's she doing now? She's doing fine. She's into everything. Her terrible twos have begun, so she's, she's perfectly normal. Sounds like she's nearby. Actually, she's playing right here. You think she might uh, come on and say hello? Come on, don't be shy. Say hi to Richard. Say hi, Victoria. Hi. Say hi. <laughs> Well, obviously she's not interested in me, but I want to thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having us, Richard. Goodbye. Bye-bye. We're all done? Yes, we're all done, Victoria. Bye-bye. <laughs> Esther's amazing story came to us from Guideposts Magazine, a publication that is always filled with inspirational true stories. We'll be right back. Coming up... After a young woman's heart stops and a medical team fights for two hours to bring her back to life, her heart stops again. It was a situation where we thought, now we are going to lose her. If God has given us one miracle, brought her back from death once, he's not going to bring her back from death again. The birth of a child is usually a time of rejoicing, but when medical complications set in, it can become a time of intense worry and sorrow. Our next story follows the difficult birth of premature twin girls and the unexpected turn of events that left an entire hospital staff believing in miracles. When Joe Gomes met Teresa Gallagillo, it was love at first sight. And I saw Teresa walking, and I fell in love with her like that. And she told me right off the bat, she goes, I'm not looking for a boyfriend. And of course, I played along with it, knowing that I was going to marry this girl sometime. And so I was trying to act as cool as I could, and we went out once or twice a week. Teresa and Joe were wed in 1994, and immediately began to start a family. When their first child, Alex, was 14 months old, Teresa became pregnant with twins, but their picture-perfect life would end with a visit to Mercy San Juan Medical Center and their obstetrician, Dr. Jose Cueto. Right from the very beginning, it was apparent that this was a high-risk pregnancy. So the first twin is growing appropriately, but the second twin is lagging behind by about three or four weeks. Well, what does that mean? The doctor explained that Teresa's placenta was not providing one of the twins with sufficient nutrition. 
that's, that's what scared me a little bit because that would mean an early birth and of course with early birth come a lot of complications that uh, I didn't want to think about. The fact that then the twins started growing discordantly, one twin was growing and the other twin was not growing, placed her even in a higher risk group of pregnancies. In her 28th week, Teresa was hospitalized under the care of high-risk pregnancy specialist, Dr. William Gilbert. The reason we put her in the hospital was to give her, give her oxygen and to monitor the small baby to be able to intervene if the baby started showing signs of distress or was a potential going to die. When the smaller twins stopped growing altogether, doctors decided on an immediate cesarean delivery. Dr. Gilbert reassured me a lot that things were going to work out. And so I was very, very optimistic, very optimistic. The medical team prepared for what they hoped would be a standard cesarean section. But with the babies 10 weeks premature, they were taking every precaution. Dr. Stephen Cohen was Teresa's anesthesiologist. Uh, there was an abnormal placenta. And what that means to me is that that's a, a very dangerous situation because the potential and likelihood for bleeding is considerable and it was my decision to do a general anesthetic. Sleep in just a moment, everything's going great. Take a nice big deep breath, good. Initially everything went very smoothly. As soon as we got into the abdomen though, it became apparent that something was wrong. Teresa was losing a lot of blood. Hand me that bladder blade back. Okay. All right, let's go. But before they could treat the problem, they would have to move quickly to deliver the two baby girls. You got the feet, all right, good. Pressure, little pressure, pressure, good. There he comes, really good. Excellent. Four count. Suction. Good. That's a small one. Good, 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 good. good. Check, uh, they're ready for the toes. Here you go. Oh, it's good for a minute. I want to see that for a All right, let's go. Cut the baby off. Okay, you got it? Yeah, here you go. Good. Go ahead. Good. Nurse Jamie Caldwell helped prepare the tiny infants for intensive care. The smaller one weighed just over a pound. Once the babies were delivered and the uh, neonatologist had had an opportunity to look them over, we could hear them crying see them moving. Everyone is very happy, very reassured to see that. Then I walked out of the operating room and, and saw Joe. Your babies are here. They oh, look great. Yeah. You have two girls. And um, immediately he, he started crying. He was just very emotional, very relieved that the babies were doing well at that point. To see a baby as small as our little one, Emily, it's amazing. I mean, she fit in the palm of my hand. And then you look next door at her sister, Jamie, who was a whopping three pounds, one ounce, and she looked giant. Oh, I almost got a little bit scared at that point. It's like, how can something so small survive? But it wasn't the baby's survival that was now in jeopardy. It was Teresa's. All of a sudden, her blood pressure started to drop. She's losing a lot of blood. Losing a lot of blood, okay. Here's another unit, Doctor. She was bleeding profusely, and this certainly now was no ordinary cesarean section. Suture, can I have Stitch. a, uh, that's fine. Suture scissors. Thank you. Right away, Dr. Gilbert and I made the decision that we had to move quickly and perform a hysterectomy. Let's take out the uterus. Okay, okay. Well, now we're right there. She's there. starting to bleed a lot more. So in removing the uterus, we removed a portion of the bladder in order to attempt to control the bleeding. It was just an immense amount of blood, and Teresa was going down fast. And then, without warning, Teresa's heart flatlined. Feel for pulse. Pulse. Pulse down there. All right, let's start the heart blues. Dr. Melvin Nunn began emergency heart massage. All of a sudden, that blood pressure was down, flat, and also the EKG was flatlined. And I started CPR. Compression. Nurse Judy Downey had also answered the code blue. Dr. Nunn did heart compressions. It seemed like forever to me, like an hour and a half. He is not a big man, and he just kept going, going. I have never seen anything quite like this in my whole 35 years in the operating room. Feel for Paul. But a young, healthy, 30-something-year-old woman to have a, her heart stop on the table, something that I had never been exposed to before. The longer it took to bring her back, the less of a chance we could bring her back. I said, I better go talk to Joe because it's not looking good here. Joe, just want to tell you some things that's been going on. I know it's been a while. He said, Joe, there's been some complications. She's lost a lot of blood. 
Another complication is that uh, Teresa's heart has stopped. Oh my God. And uh, what I need to do is get back in there and give them a hand. I was just a wreck and I started praying. By the time Dr. Gilbert returned to the OR, Joe's prayers had been answered. Teresa's vital signs had stabilized. Yeah, she's stable. At that point, her heart started beating again regularly. And I remember him saying, we got her back. And when I heard that, it was my, my life, you know, jump-started again. You know, I've got my wife back, and I've got the mother of my children back. Teresa was alive, but in critical condition. There's some more blood. Four more units. How much more do you need? Keep it coming. I don't think I've, I've had to give so much blood volume in such a short period of time. And it was particularly hard thinking that even if we bring her back, is she going to be on this ventilator for the rest of her life a vegetable? And then suddenly, Teresa's heart flatlined for a second time. No pulse, no pulse yet, no pulse yet. To go from elation, happiness, that she's back, and then she codes again. It was a situation where we thought, now we are going to lose her. If God has given us one miracle, brought her back from death once, he's not going to bring her back from death again. The dramatic conclusion when It's a Miracle continues. Next, Joe prays for Teresa to live and receives a gift from a stranger. It was a medallion of the Virgin Mary. And she said, Joe, this medallion has produced three miracles and it's going to produce a fourth for you. Of course, at that point, you tend to grab on to whatever you can. During the cesarean delivery of premature twin girls, the mother's heart stops beating and an entire hospital staff mobilizes to save her life. And then, after nearly two hours of CPR and blood transfusions, the unthinkable happens. Her heart flatlines for a second time. The situation now required a much more drastic approach. You have 300. Clear. Okay. okay. Feel okay. for both? She's got a both. Okay, great. Right. Miraculously, the shock to her heart brought Teresa back to life again. But her doctor's concerns were far from over. There was anything but elation at this time. Realizing we have several things to worry about, her kidney function, her liver function, her brain function, not knowing if she would even survive the night. Teresa was transferred to intensive care where she remained in a deep coma. You do the best you can and you, you end up with somebody in the intensive care unit who may not make it or may not be normal if she does make it. You know, I remember thinking at that point that I want my wife back. I don't care what condition, but I'm never going to take another day for granted. I'm never going to take another I love you or a hug for granted. And I want my wife back in any condition. That's, that's what was going through my mind. Overwhelmed by everything that had happened during the past 12 hours, Joe took a moment to visit the hospital chapel. The priest asked if anybody in the audience needed prayers, and I immediately stood up. I asked the congregation to, to pray for my wife and my family, that we'd been through a heck of an ordeal. And uh, during the operation, they couldn't control the bleeding, and she ended up taking over six and a half hours, over 100 units of blood. And I just came back from the ICU ward, where the doctor gave her virtually no hope for surviving the night. And I, I asked for your prayers for her and, and my, uh, her, my, my twin girls, Emily and Jamie. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this family the mother After the service, children. two strangers approached Joe to offer their sympathy. Joe, I'm so sorry to hear about your wife. One of them assured me that she was going to pray for Teresa and my family, and the other one the pressed the medallion in my hand. It has already worked three miracles. And it was a medallion of the Virgin Mary. And she said, Joe, this medallion has produced three miracles, and it's going to produce a fourth for you. What should I do with it? She goes, uh, take the medallion into your wife's room and press it to her forehead and through divine intervention create a healing miracle. I'll do that, thank you very much. You're welcome, bless you. Of course, 
at that point you, you tend to grab onto whatever you can. I went to Teresa's room. I had the new Polaroids of the girls and I put the medallion on my wife's forehead. She told me to produce three miracles and it's going to produce a fourth for me. I took the pictures and I put them in front of my wife's eyes and I said, honey, I know you can't see me and you probably can't hear me, but I want to let you know that I can't do this by myself. But sweetheart, they need you. They need a mother. I can't feed these little girls, honey. I can't dress these little girls. I can't produce mother's milk. I don't have the nerve. From somewhere in the depths of her coma, Teresa miraculously heard her husband's prayer. At that point, uh, yeah, I remember, I, I remember screaming, Nurse! Nurse! The nurses came running in, and, and I remember them scratching her finger. Can you move your finger? Can you feel this? And she moved her fingers, and she moved her toes. Oh, good job. All right. She's been pretty sick here. Okay. I just thought I was coming out of a normal anesthesia. I'm thinking, gosh, this is so strange. Why are they so excited I can move my fingers and my toes? Against all odds, Teresa had emerged without any long-term effects. And I can even swear I remember something on my forehead. I remember the, something pressing here. I couldn't move anything. And I'm like, oh my gosh, something's wrong. I gotta let him know I'm okay. You know, I gotta come out of this anesthesia so I can, you know, tell him, that I'm okay, honey, don't worry, I'm okay. So finally, I pried my eyes open. That's when I knew a miracle had occurred. Three years have passed since Teresa's miracle and she and her twin girls are all doing fine. For her to have survived 100% intact, a miracle is probably an understatement. Right here, yeah, I got him. You have to think of a higher power. You just have to, because you cannot explain it. And if you did not believe in God or in miracles before, you definitely believed in God and in miracles afterwards. Three. Miracles happen. And if you believe in it with all your heart and all your soul, like I do, miracles happen. And they happen every day. Still to come, a firefighter risks his life to pull a mother and child from a burning building. But there's something eerily familiar about this fire. It dawned on me that I was reliving the dream. He'd dreamt it all before, and that meant there was still one more person trapped inside. Have you ever had a dream that was so real, so terrifying, that you weren't sure whether you were asleep or awake? Well, the man in our next story knows the feeling all too well. In fact, one night 20 years ago, he had just such a dream. Only when he woke up, the nightmare didn't end. It was late at night in the winter of 1981 when fire captain Ed Cushing suddenly woke from a terrifying dream. <laughs> I jumped up at around four in the morning and I was all full of sweat. I just had the strangest dream. There was a fire and I saved three people. The details were so clear that even 20 years later, he still remembers them as if they happened yesterday. It was in a, an older neighborhood and people were yelling at the three people in the building. There's three people inside, there's a mother. They told me that there was the two children and a mother. In his dream, Ed suddenly found himself inside the inferno, searching for the victims. There was very dense smoke couldn't see your hand in front of you. So I was just feeling my way. And I felt the body. It was the mother. He rushed the unconscious woman outside where he began administering CPR in a desperate attempt to save her life. Then I ran back into the house to find the children, you know? Sure enough, I come across one of the kids and I get him out. But now I know that there's a third one, but the smoke now is so thick. And then I'm crawling up the stairs, and sure enough, in, in the hallway outside the bedroom, I find the other boy. Then I get outside, and the chief is standing there. It's just me. Good job, Cushing. 
that was my dream. I saved three people all by myself. And I was raised with, uh, my mother was always counted on dreams as a warning or a good sign something's going to happen. A few hours later, after Ed reported to duty, an alarm came in for a major house fire. It was only about uh, five blocks from the firehouse, so we got there within a minute and a half. First four people came up and told me that they made it out the back doors. But on the second floor, there's people in the house. But no one knew for sure how many victims were still trapped inside. Ed rushed into the building. And when I got to the second floor, the door was locked, so I had to kick it in. The mother was right outside her door. And uh, when I started picking her up the carrier, I saw a leg, and then I knew it was somebody else, so I had to come back. I took her down and I laid her in the grass. The heart wasn't beating for quite a while, maybe four minutes. And it's supposed to be three minutes, it's dead. So I said, please God, and the next time I gave a compression, her heart just beat. While another fireman administered oxygen, Ed raced back into the house. got the boy and I put my hand over to grab him and he says by me and I said oh, that's a fireman you're all right now and so I just put him on the ground next to the lady all he knew was the fresh air it was at that moment that Ed realized what was happening it dawned on me that I was reliving the dream and if the dream was accurate it meant that there was a third person still trapped inside the raging fire by now, huge flames and thick smoke enveloped the building, but Ed knew exactly where he was going. The dream led me through that fire. Every bit of that dream was true at the actual fire. He remembered that the boy was at the top of the stairs. And I made it crawling up the stairs in my belly. And I actually went to where he was, as if I knew where he was. The child wasn't breathing, and Ed couldn't find a pulse or a heartbeat. He was small, and I could give him CPR by just pushing on his chest and blowing into his face on the way down, and his heart just started up again. And then you know, I got that one out, and I said, thank you, God. I had goose pimples all over me, I just said, thank you. And then, just as in his dream, the fire chief approached Ed. Good job, Cushing. But I don't think the mother and the little boy will make it. No, no, no. They're going to make it, Chief. How do you know? Because I had this dream last night. I saw the whole thing. Now, believe me, Chief. They're going to make it. And I had no doubt in my mind because, you know, I got the message from upstairs. <laughs> Several hours later, the final chapter in Ed's dream became a reality when the woman he rescued, Suzette Tomaselli, regained consciousness. I didn't even know I was alive yet, really. As I woke up and I see my sister, and I said, oh my God, where are the boys? Her son, Michael, was recovering in another room. I remember finally coming to in a hospital, being in this oxygen tent, and looking over and I saw my cousin, you know, and I, like, what happened? The next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital and the light was on and my eyes were really sensitive. I said, turn the light down, it's hurting my eyes. The miracle was complete. I met Cushing. But it wasn't until Captain Cushing visited the family in the hospital that they learned how truly miraculous their rescue had been. I don't know if you're gonna believe it or not, but I dreamt the entire fire the night before it happened. You did? He goes, I had a premonition about this whole fire. He goes, I knew 
that there was going to be three people in this fire and they were almost going to die, but they were going to live to make it. I knew you were going to live to make it. <laughs> he even told me the layout of our apartment. And he started saying all these things about Martin being at the top of the stairs, that he knew that he was there. I knew in my dream that you were at the top of the he stairs. He told me about the premonition, and I was just amazed. And he knew right where to go and get me. I guess that was God's way of saying, that this is your second chance. For Suzette, that second chance at life would mean a second marriage. And Captain Cushing was there to give the bride away. I asked Captain Cushing, would you give me away at my wedding? I mean, I'm here because you gave me my life back. He just kind of, you know, grinned and said, yeah, you know, he'd be glad to. Captain Cushing giving my mom away has, like, really touched all the family. You know, I mean, it was, like, so appropriate. Today, Suzette Martin and Michael still feel a sense of deep gratitude to the man who saved their lives, as well as a profound sense of wonder at the circumstances that guided him. For who can explain how a man waking from a dream can find himself in the exact same situation a few hours later? Or how that dream could lead him back into the blazing building to find a child that otherwise would have surely died? There was perhaps only one. Explanation. I really believe in miracles and I believe that there's somebody watching him. The way he did everything was like perfect, like he knew just what to do. If he didn't have that dream, I'm thinking where would I be today? I wouldn't even be here. Words can't express the gratitude for him. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>